All right, game three on the line. We get Ash from T1 on the blue one pick, so I already think that they're going to be heavily favored in this draft. Anytime that Ash makes it through, I, I give heavy, heavy favor to that team. Last game's draft. I'm going to say it's not that I don't like it. I like it as a team comp, and in fact, it's a team comp that team one, T1 has worked to wonders before. In fact, they, they perfect game... They had a perfect game. What was it last year? JDG maybe that they didn't give up a single kill turret, any resource of any kind where they just had an outrange comp and they just said, we outrange you. We can poke you down from every spot. There's really nothing you can do about it. You don't have enough engage. We outrange you. That team did have enough engage and they were able to find early dives, which speaks to the lane assignments and the lane swaps discovered by wards. That all comes down to, to, preparation and genji has it we mentioned that there's a potential rift in the communication of t1 and if that's the case and i'm gonna i'm gonna say they're not communicating well i'm an outsider i will say that if i'm a coach i'm not going to say that to my team i'll say we need to communicate better we need to make sure that we are following one book one page one call in those situations Ease of execution becomes premium. And that often can be a case when your team is nervous. One of the first things that breaks down is communication, especially if you get down in the dumps a little bit. We saw it with, with Masu, unfortunately, in FlyQuest, Masu and Busio. Um, Busio first for games three and four, Masu for game five. That it just felt like they, they weren't there. They were a shell of themselves. You will not compete at your highest level. When that's the case, confidence and ease of execution and that's what ease of, ease of execution really is confidence. You're going to be confident in your ability to make that team work, make that champion work, do what you need to do in the team setting without having too much onus on how to manipulate. With all that in the backdrop, and if they're having a tough time communicating, then that long range double tank, let's move around and just mitigate, 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 that's a very tough strategy to pull off over the course of 40 minutes especially when you're talking about lane swaps and trying to get to the right assignments and everything that goes along with that so i would want if i if i'm coaching and i'm drafting for t1 i'm going to try to get ease of execution which normally means dive early game and dive it's just scripted i'm going to make this play happen over and over and over we know that we're going to play aggressive i love that they picked up the vi to go with the ash Ash Vi, super easy to understand. We're looking for the pick. We're looking to step forward. We want to get maximum damage. We see a Kali from Faker into Ari. This is going to be, this is going to be hype. I can't imagine that Cho Chovy doesn't get out of this lane with a 20 CS lead. And this is what he's going to want. He, he wants this. He wants to show like, no, I can gap this guy. And I promise you, Chovy would love nothing more then to win this game and then flip the script, give Faker Ari and then play Akali himself and clap him again. That is what that is Chovy's version of the best wins. Zeus is sitting on a ward. That was an E flash right there. They're gonna get the Gragas. Who's he trying to give the kill to? They end up giving it to the Ezreal. Another ward potentially winning the game early on. Slash All right, so they're coming out onto the map 23 seconds in. Gragas is taking this line in. We're seeing Jax Ezreal moving together. Gragas gets there. That's the difference. Is this just a move speed difference? It can't be. There's no way. It can't just be move speed. Jax gets that ward in. I learned something today, guys. I did not know this was possible. Jax got this ward in faster than Gragas got vision of, of Jax doing it. I didn't even think you can place a ward that fast. You can't even place a ward until, oh, it's 30 seconds. You can only place a ward at 30 seconds. It's, it's grayed out. It literally won't let you do it. So they get those wards out. One down here, one down here. They move over. So this is anti-exploitative. You're making sure to get this whole area warded. This is one of the biggest scopes a ward can get in the entire game. As far as total amount of vision, apart from just put, sticking it in the middle of mid lane, this is one of the best spots in the, in the whole game that can see all of the motions. They are pinging that they have a ward down. At that moment... You need to know, hey, they just weak-sided this area. Anytime that, you're, that your opponents are putting a ward down here, it's to weak-side. 
right? They're covering their bases. They're saying, hey, let's just find out what's happening over here while we go to this side of the map. So the call needed to be immediate to get the Gragas out. But uh, this is all prep from Gen G. Beautifully done. Love how they did it. I don't doubt that Jax's movements, by the way, were pixel perfect to get to that spot, drop that ward right at 30 and get back. We're going to give him full credit. Assume that that's the case because that is a preparation ward. There's no Silas in this game. But if we do continue to see Silas in the series like we expect to, we will continue to see level one invades because Silas is the best champion in the game for a level one invade because he's the only one who has two abilities that allow you to get over a wall and stun, right? So when you level up your E as Silas level one, you can, for example, just get over this wall and then jump into this bush. And you can do it while your team starts coming this way uh, and collapse on it. We've seen it before. I'm sure we'll see it again. These teams are presumptively prepared for it though. Uh, and, and see if it ever comes up. All right, Gragas versus Jax. Gragas has full mitigating power here. You basically never get hit by the counter strike because your belly bop has a larger hit radius than the leap strike. So every time that Jax goes for the leap, you just belly bop him out and there's no, there's no counter play. Nice job by Karia poking back Lehens as they're hitting level two, guys. Perfect timing, stepping up, realizing, hey, I'm going to pull you in because we are going to continue this fight. We're going to hit level two. Lehens was trying to jump out and get a shield up, but beautifully done. That's a, a significant chunk trade going to win at least a potion. It looks like both. Yeah, two potions being used there by Lehens. One Q for two potions. It's worth 100 gold. Think about how much that's worth. That's insane. Bypassing bottom. Nocturne a little bit behind on the tempo on the time. It wasn't because he shopped. He did go four camps. Oh, no, he started with it. With it. He started. Okay, invade into the side wrap. All right, here we go. Four camps. This is because of the alternating. I missed it. Sorry, guys. Each jungler is playing on four camps. Vi's got five. They did contest over one. 19 CS. So he's going to be picking up 24, hitting level four here. And Nocturne's just a slight step behind on the path. And you see that he's clearing all the little camps first. This is a Nocturne Hecarim special. Uh, it's not only do you clear them faster, but it's also your best way of hitting level six faster is to get those second rounds of respawns up as quickly as possible. We were watching so much on that level one play that we didn't think to look at the junglers responsing, uh, how they would respond, but good answers. Vi is now in a position for a dive. It does get a ward down for herself to see whether or not Ari's ever going to come over, but it looks like they're not even going to try for it. I'm very surprised by this because... Setting this Ezreal back should be priority number one. It's very difficult to do. Maybe, you know, you might even say it's almost impossible. But if you can get any amount of pressure through this mid wave and try to get a 4v2 while Nocturne's on the top side of the map, you can absolutely go for that. Gragas, hard countering Jax right here. We give him the one stun. He's going to heal this right back up. It's not even going to matter. Poking under turret, Renata Ash. We love this combination. Using the scouting, Vi dropped the wards over here. You've, we've got full coverage. They do see the Nocturne, and that's going to give them information that the next comp, camp to come up and where the Nocturne's looking to path. It's going to be on this Gromp. He's going to start pathing, but they have that entirely lit up. They want to make sure that Nocturne gets no access to early ganks. Vi's going to get some information about a Nocturne trying to invade, but she knows that none of these camps are up. She might go and just go for an invade for herself or just say, hey, like, let's go to fight, make sure. That yeah, look at this. Vi's going to cover the bot side. That He's making a move all the way here just to cover the Nocturne moving forward. And until he shows again on vision, Vi stays in that area to make sure that there's no dive happening. It is too early in the game for Nocturne to hit six, uh, but he will be going after that shortly. One more rotation on his small camps and he'll do it. Uh, it looks like slightly syncopated based on where they're at. Vi's motion cost her a little bit of tempo. On Raptors now, Nocturne has information of it. So you better believe that these guys are tracking every single motion. Look at all these pings coming out. They're saying, hey, this is where they are. Ari stopping the Akali back is massive. Massive. That buys you about 20 seconds of time. And that can be the difference for a full wave. But you see Ash is already here in position. So Ari's going to go ahead and teleport. Or, or sorry, Ari. Akali's going to go and get to the next side wave. It looks like Ezreal's already pushing in bot. So Akali's not pressured to teleport there. 
Although there are some worlds where you go for it, because look, right? You shop right before you hit level six. Akali is the Ezreal killer. We've we've sort of come to, to to the conclusion like the things that we learn about when they want Akali. This is generally public enemy number one. Akali seems to be the best and the the most reliable way to kill Ezreal in the in the entire game. So I don't know if if that's the pri primary reason or if that's what they're going to expect, but definitely look to watch Faker try to aggress upon Pays. Try to find Ezreal in these fights because you have such good tracking on the spells. The R R E is going to be a nice little combo for them, and they're going to try to get more. All right, bot side they spot them <clears throat> on Dragon or they hear them on Dragon. They're pushing on top. Are they going to go for a gank? Jax is very difficult at level six. He gets all that extra resource. They're already bringing up the Rel. Uma going for a little bit of a poke. Gragas getting a little bit of poke. Takes one turret damage in response. Because they go for that chip damage, it actually means Vi can, cannot stay for the rest of the Krugs. And so you actually end up, again, with a little bit of discord, a little bit of dissonance, where it's like, I'm front, I'm back. Oh, I'm here, I'm back. Wait, you're going for turret dive? No, I'm trying to take camps. Like, you know, they're, they're, those little things, even on a one second macro choice of whether or not you are invading versus diving that can be the difference between whether or not your team comes up with a good concise plan or not govi with grasp again into this melee matchup by the way on ari obviously being okay with playing this champion in that spot in is by himself vi is in range and is level six is out of vision there we go ash alt into vi alt he gets the jump, but not before. He gets a, another step back, but it is going to be enough, and they're going to give the kill. Oh, it looks like it looks like they were trying to give it to Ash, but Vi getting it is also totally fine. Vi is a huge portion of what their team is trying to do this game, and getting the Vi to jump ahead is going to spring forward her, vault her into position where she can do so much more for the team. Ash is just on Berserker Greaves, right? You're so far away from any item that matters that you don't really need to care so much. You may even say, like, hey, we've got our, like, next, I don't know what it's going to be, Allfields Warhammer, probably not. It's going to be parts of Kraken Slayer, Rectrix, something like this. Oh, going Trot. And see Triforce Ash? We haven't seen Triforce Ash in forever. I think we're going to see, uh, who knows? We'll, we'll see where they're going. Being Staying flexible, maybe. But saying we are far enough from our completed item, and we're playing the supportive AD support right like that's that's why ash is so good in this meta this is why we prefer team comps with ash compared to teams with ezreal because you can do so much more for your team and you can play for those mid lane carries based on the total amount of experience that's in the game now there's just so much more for for the solo lane so you give it to vi vi's gonna look to continue to make plays across the map outpace the nocturne is also important if these champions get a little bit of lead in the jungle and they're able to take camps faster than their adversary, then that means they can contest camps that the other team just can't even think about. That is that is one of the less appreciated aspects of jungle leads. Gold's even, dragons in one pocket, void grubs in the other. Uh, T1 has been a void grubs type team, but we've seen from the meta this tournament that the teams that are willing to scale and let you get Void Grubs and then punish your plays are generally doing well for themselves as long as they can keep to that narrative. Sometimes they they extract themselves from their own game plan and get punished for it. T1's going to continue making proactive plays with Ash and Vi as initiators. You might even see Gragas doing it. Uh, such a strong counterpick. He's actually continuing forward, even though... That's an ultimate down from Jax. Greg is just feeling himself, knows how strong he is. Says, I can continue this fight because I have a Vi in place. The Ash Arrow goes back. Vi doesn't opt for it. They don't have the flash timer. They don't have Jax's flash timer. It's got to be because Vi could have cast that ultimate and they could have gone for it. That Ash cast a beautiful ult that forced the Jax to pause and get in range of the Vi. But Vi says, I don't want to take it. I don't want to be pulled back into turret. Something that can be done with Ward Hop plus Flash. That just wasn't an issue. And and it's a missed opportunity because Vi has that lead. You have every time that you get that extra kill. Hold on. 
Looks like we're, uh, oh, they're wrapping. They're wrapping hard. Ari's even moving into position here. We've got four people wrapping on two, turning out the lights. Are they going to turn back into this? They do have Renata, so they're willing to take this fight. They're going to keep this fight going this way and moving away from the Ari, right? Watch them continue. They actually take this fight, the early game team, with a slight lead. They say we can take it, and I love watching fake Ronakali. <laughs> it's so good. I mean, Showmaker probably does it at a whole nother level. But Faker's decision trees are so clean. His macro is so clean on this champion. So they go in despite the lights being turned off. By the way, did you notice the players on T1 spying each other's camera? As the Nocturne lights go off, you can just take a quick peek and see. See what your teammate sees. All right, a lot of pressure off the back of this. They do have the Void Grubs. That is going to die to the bleeding there, so they can take that down. They're going to reset. Now we're in Snowball territory. 3K gold lead. You're going to give a little bit of it back right now as you recall. Let's watch this fight. How do they ever survive this? Karia holding out on the outside of the fight. Jax comes in. We have ult into ult. So Vi goes, peels back, and then flashes out of range to make sure that she doesn't get hit by the initial. That leaves Lehens alone in the middle of the fight, and it looks like they call off the fight Ari trying to move into position with walking is just not enough. Baker having exacties to get that kill there. Crowd's gonna go nuts, by the way. Turn on the turn on the sound for that. We can actually keep the sound on. It, it's nice to hear the crowd. All right, so where do you play for strength now? Now with this lead, you're looking to snowball. You're fighting for everything. If you're T1, you can p fight for all the objectives. Gen.G is going to have to give up something, which is a tough world for Nocturne to be in. Nocturne would like to take the weak side player and, and get that kill. Right, if you can create a two-on-one weak side, if they're going for a 4-1 split, you can use the Nocturne to try to react to that. And that's one of the reasons that you take Nocturne or why you're comfortable with Nocturne into an Akali game. All right, if you're going to split push, I've got this access. Unfortunately, we know that Faker has all the defensive tools in the world to be happy against the Nocturne. This is why they chose Akali compared to anything else, right? I, I can survive your dive. I can go invisible. You cannot leash your, your fear onto me. You'll never see me. Govi with the demolish. Again, wants to carry. Like, we know if, and if there's one folly that this team could have, it would be that Chovy's hubris, his desire to prove that he's the best, could take it. And we saw it in that pregame from, from Faker. What an epic quote. Chovy, you truly are the future. Prove it. And so, like, it's so good. But it's, it's also calculated. It's also exactly what Faker's been doing to Chovy his entire career, which is in key moments, I get you to overplay. I get you to go for a wave that you shouldn't go for. I get you to go for a play that you shouldn't go for. Yeah, you're better mechanically than me. It's a joy to go up against you. What a beautiful interview in that pregame. I hope, hopefully you guys didn't uh, miss out on that. If you, if you have, go back, check the game one footage, and we spent time doing the pregame with the hype and everything going on with the game. This is the most hyped up game that we've seen at worlds in in memorable in the memorable history you have all these lines but none none bigger than chovy versus faker i hope we're going to try to collapse rel sometimes casts her ultimate in response to the charge doesn't doesn't end up going for it which means they're going to give up everything including the rel's life what are they doing Beautiful, beautiful. They say zero hesitation. We're going to go in. You want to try to stop this play? Boom, we're going in right now. That's so sick, which means they're going to get access to this turret as well. They baited Jax in here. Carrier can take the rest of the fight, but Carrier's going to look to, to keep Pays out of the fight. They have enough tools already to win. Barely, but they do get it. It's enough. Carrier realizing that my job is not to continue the fight here. It's to make sure that they don't get anything on the rebound side. This guy is so damned good at supporting. If you if you want to be a good support, just watch Karia. This guy is super locked in. He's the one who said at Worlds is where we shine brightest. He saves his very best for those moments. Bi plus Ash combination, so nice. 
queued up to follow the ash patch of his stacks and they're able to get a double for Kuma. Beautiful. And what's crazy is they didn't even slow down there because Faker was pushing up the top wave. They turn to top, they get that objective as well. They get another kill. It's, uh, it's gone from bad to worse. I think that, uh, that was some nerves, guys. You see that on the face? That is some um, frantic help me. Rovi keeping the minion alive for as long as possible so that they can go and get the demolish proc, step it up. Nice job. Take one turret shot. Step out of range so that it travels the maximum amount of distance. A uh, small thing just worth mentioning. That turret, it has this range to hit you. You step in and take aggro. And if you walk out, the bullet that's chasing you is going to continue chasing you. And then they move laterally that it chases and then they step back in for a moment as it's hitting so that the turret as it's looking for who should i hit next oh i should continue hitting the guy i'm still hitting you hear the little dink and then it moves back out of range this is how you can buy an extra half second on every turret shot when you're under turret if you're a ranged champion only applicable at the highest highest apex tiers but you better believe these guys can do it we just saw trovi do it they're talking about two dragons two dragons are completely meaningless now you're not going to touch a single objective for the rest of the game it, it does mean that a soul is far away but we on this channel if you guys if you guys are subscribed and you know dragon soul has not been a win condition since its inception only the misconception of dragon soul being a wing condition has become its own form of wing condition where you can trick the other enemy team into going for it and you go get baron there's really nothing to be said about soul it's only a win more and all the teams hold on we're going to watch the rest of this fight they make the call we can continue this carry is holding back the other side nocturne's trying to use the paranoia to get out they're going to clean him up get jacks out as well this is going to be a full cleanup you got everyone popping off and this is going to be two wins for t1 Two minutes left uh, until Baron, so they can't even get the prize that they would normally go for. But they're going to go pick up other camps. They're going to say, we're alive, you're dead, we can farm, you can't. More access for us. Notice, there's nothing on the map. What are they supposed to get? There's None of these camps are up at all. And none of the waves are in position. So the only thing you can do is Ezreal can step up and clear a wave. He can cast his ultimate, start pushing. That's it. You don't have access to anything more. This is that snowball we were talking about. T1 does it better than any, anybody else. And it's all methodical, right? Beautifully done. Nice call. Got it. We've got enough. Oof, the nerves. Nice sidestep there by Chovy. Individual play is the only way you're going to get out of this situation. They get the bailout. He's alive. There he is on the outskirts, just ready to cast max range supportive spells, get those shields out. Surviving there, so good. Karia, guys, Karia is so incredibly good. Might be the best player on this team. Um, this is a full health Chovy with extra grasp stacks. You know, he's got he's got two items and it's Leandry, so that's going to be chipping away. That damage is ticking up, right? The longer you're in combat, you get that first chunk of damage, it starts ticking up. The pain, or whatever it's called, is it pain is the name of it, or anguish, the name of that passive. You start dealing more and more damage, you go up, the longer second rotation of spells really starts to hurt in those spots. Alright, Hextech Gates does put a wrinkle into the plans here, but it does mean that the winning team can move around the map much faster. They're going to look, control all the wards on their side of the map. First, you make sure to clean up your quadrant while you pick up the wave. Step two, change colors. Step two is to gain prio here and win the beach. 
Step three, once you have the beach, then you're going to go up and say, I'm going to push to the point where I can threaten your turrets and I'm going to start sealing you into your own jungle. Once we seal you into your own jungle, then it's just a matter of time where we're going to be able to take everything. We can go start the Baron. You're going to have to walk through through darkness uh, into our traps. Hold on. They got Guma. This is a little bit over eager. Remember we said it was going to be step by step by step. They just jumped straight into step three. Perhaps they're saying, hey, we've got like a 6k gold lead. We probably have two completed items over them. We don't need to... We don't need to wait. We can go ahead and just take this now. But that uh, step by step approach, and uh, damn. Nice spot. You see this? Teleport to this ward. Tucking in a ward. Finding a way to get a ward behind them. Look how much effort they put into getting over here. But our, someone was able to get that ward in behind them. See this? No one sees this. It's not until you turn off the lights. Now those control wards don't see it either. So now Ari gets to just walk in straight forward, get to the ash, and there's no, there's no contest. Dude, his heart that is thrombosis. You can see his chest heaving. Tense. All right, hold on. They're going forward. He's stepping. He's saying, hey, this is our time. The Asher is a little bit short. You'd much rather have it split the team up. Gragas, go a little bit overreach. This is three different spells now. You've used a little bit of Akali's health. You've used Zeus dashing forward and Ash. So you have to pull back. You no longer have the lead. Right now, it's even. Even though you have those extra resources in your inventory and the extra items, they don't mean anything if you've already cast spells and used up your combative uh, prowess. You have to be really, really careful. You've already given up. So good job by T1 realizing they can fall back, turning their power into strength somewhere else. All right, line of scrimmage in mid. They're going to draw this line right here and say, you shall not pass Gen G. If you're Gen G, you should just count. You should stop this by going to Baron and force them to come off. The only good answer would be to leave Vi and then have Vi come over slowly while the rest of the team goes for a four-man defense. We'll see whether or not he delays this take at all. I don't think there's any reason to do that. You're totally fine with pushing the tempo in this game. There are worlds where sometimes you want to delay takes just like you would delay a kill. Nice job by Rel to uh, stop the dash in the middle of its progress. But again, did they keep? Uh, did they catch up to them? Going too far front to back, they decide not to go further. They could have gone further if it weren't for the for the lights being turned out. But the paranoia sets in. They don't go back. They recollect their area. Gragas right there. Notice that he puts the Q down. But once Ash shows up, he just gives the farm. You guys can do this too. Who is your carry? Multiply their levels times their items as much as possible. You want to give them all the resources in the world. When Once you're level 6 and everyone has their ultimate from that point on, you essentially just want this carry to get so much. Look at this. He's already the same level as all of these guys because they've given so much to the Ash. So... Will they be able to tuck another ward in? I'm sure T1's not going to make the same mistake. You see the lines of wards that they've got out. They've got the one deep ward right here, right? You're going to continue to seeing this. As you progress further into the lane, you'll try to get that ward deeper and deeper. One ward in the lane. Sometimes you'll go for a redundant ward, something like here and here, to make sure that you, you see it crosses through this junction and through this junction. And as long as you have those two junctions covered, you're going to be able to see the majority of movements from the enemy team. But it is a Nocturne team, so you have to be very precise with your movements. You can't do the same things that you do against everyone else, right? You have to think of it like it's Twisted Fate or, you know, Nocturne, these champions that can make plays from anywhere. You have to make sure that you, when you decide to step forward, you're doing it together. You punch through with a hammer or with a fist. You make space. And then you say, all right, we've claimed that space, ward it. Now move over to another area where we can claim space and ward it. And it's going to be a push, 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 push. And basically bulldoze the enemy team until they're stuck on this side of their own red side jungle. All right, they start it. Gragas is on weak side. He's got teleport up. If paranoia gets cast, you can cast your ultimate right away. And you have like a half second, quarter second even, to get that ultimate. It looks like they're just trying to pull some rotations. They're not doing anything else. Eventually, Genji is going to run out of wards, run out of scryers, and they are going to have to face check. 
Once you do gain this beach, you try to set yourself a three minute timer. This is if you have the luxury of it. Three minutes means that you're talking about everything that's behind you has faded out. All the wards are gone and any of the effects that that they would have used to try to get there. Really, it's just two minutes, but that full three minute pressure from the beginning, you can say, I've had enough time, I've checked, I've pushed up. You have enough of that window, especially between dragons to do it step by step by step. It's sort of like that old Roman phalanx where they put the shields up together and then together they'd go heave and everybody takes a step forward and you move the entire blockade forward. And with that motion, you could get extra ground and extra ground and gain turf on your territory by moving as one. It's the same exact thing when you're here playing against Nocturne. Space by space by space. All right, so they're taking a moment. 130 left on the dragon. They're actually swapping their strong side over here. They're going to dare Gen G to try to pull any kind of trigger on Baron. They're giving up a little bit of presence. Only two wards left on this side that will be fading out. And they're starting to consolidate on this side, leaving Gragas on the top. They're going to step back and pick up this in 10 seconds. This red might be the trigger that they're looking for. They might say, hey, once we get this red buff, we're looking to push it from here on in. Uh, you also don't want to fight into the red buff of the other team, right? Like, why not check all the boxes? Dot, dot all the I's, cross all the T's. You might as well. You've got such a dominant position for yourself. Now you can go and say, all right, your red buff is gone. Ours is just starting. And now we will be that much stronger. The question is, is it going to align with number three and number four, or are you going to try to set it up for Baron? I imagine that they're going to try to do it through Baron, play for the end, but honestly, they've already gotten the majority of the objectives that you look from Baron number one. This will kind of have to be a push for the end of the game. Not have to. They'll just try to get significant structural damage. But you see that they're just putting Gragas over here on defense. He's plenty healthy. Cosmic Drive plus Seeker's Arm Guard, right? This is all the AP that he needs. Uh, I don't expect to see something like Abyssal Mask, but it could come out in a game like this, right? About 30% of the damage here is magic. Same here. About 95% of Ari's damage, 99% maybe even. All of Rel's damage. So Abyssal Mask might actually be very good. It also helps the dive with the Akali. So, you know, I changed my mind. I said I didn't expect it. I actually fully expect it. I hope it's going to be a fourth item Abyssal Mask. But T1 saying, hey, we just continue to, to grow our lead. It went from 6k to 7. Not a big lead, but now with the red buff, now they're going to feel stronger. Third dragon, three hex dragons. This wave is pushed. This wave is pushed. They want this one to get at least halfway, really at least to this area, before they look to make the play on Baron, and then all their waves will be in position that when they do get the Baron, they can look to try to end. Often overlooked thing about Baron is wave prep, making sure that your waves are in the right spot so that when you do go for the fight, you're putting your opponents in between a rock and a hard place. Nocturne's coming over into this quadrant, which is a little bit of a surprise. Maybe he's anticipating that there's no, no wards here, so I can sneak in, maybe get a little bit further than I otherwise could have without being seen. Uh, maybe I pick off a raptor camp here or there, but it ends up coming right back over. Level 16 picked up by Ari. Actually ahead of the Akali here. Jax is slightly behind the Akali and Ash. Are they going to wait for 16s to press forward here? Vi is almost there, Akali is almost there, Ash is almost there. And you're at level 11 on the support, so you really don't care about getting anything else. Kerry is actually going to volunteer to step out of the XP range. Now, to try to multiply as much of that XP onto the solos as possible, I'm sure that they're going to go for level 16s and then press in all the way. But it is going to coincide with, with Ezreal at least hitting it, and probably Jax as well. You see Jax picking up the wave. We talked about waves being in the right spot. They is pushing out this wave. They're actually saying, hey, you can keep on pushing. We're strong enough here. Does Gen G find the 5v4 with Nocturne in response? That's the question. He's saying, I'm going to go a little bit further. I haven't gone this far all game. I'm going to go take it right now. I'm forcing Jax to come to me. This is our window to go press up. Expect them to push up middle, and now they're going to fight for this beach, and then they're going to go into the Baron Pit. 
They push up mid. They don't get the ward down, but they don't need the ward because Gragas is there and the wave is there. They can save the rest. They do get one pull. That's a dash. That's going to be everything onto, onto Paze, but he does survive to start. Akali's trying to ult in to get the rest of this, but the lights are off. Paze survives. Redemption's beautiful. The team has been scattered enough. It's still going to be T1 favored, but my goodness, what a play by Paze to survive as long as he did. So nice. But did you see T1? Guys, this is what beautiful macro is like. We've been watching T1 for 10 years, over 10 years. It doesn't change. They've figured out the best way to press in when they can push your buttons and say, all right, we've got everything locked in and in place. Time to push a little bit harder. You saw Gragas throw the jab. That jab was never meant to do any damage. It was meant to pull any amount of resources to that side of the map so that they could take the mid lane push so that they could push in to the jungle and go after it. And even though Pays was able to dash, flash, cleanse, and a second dash up in that fight, they're still able to connect with him uh, with the power of Akali. Hello. Oh, and he doesn't even die. Faker, what is this? All right, 2 1. Are you ready? Who's next?